My name is Major General Craig Aitchison. I'm the commander of the Canadian Defence Academy in Kingston, Ontario, responsible for the Canadian Armed Forces Common Professional Development uh, System. I was first exposed to design peripherally uh, when I did the Joint Command Staff Program in Toronto in uh, 19, or sorry, 2007, 2008, where uh, I think the second year was introduced as an elective. I didn't take the elective, but I had a number of friends that did um, under the banner of systemic operational design. But a few years later, as I was doing my work college program in the United States, I had the chance to study it in detail um, as part of my work college experience, where I was exposed to the idea of uh, everything from chaos theory to uh, systemic thinking, and had the opportunity to work with some design experts in the U.S. Army, like Dr. Alice Butler Smith. Um, had the chance as part of that program to meet uh, pioneers in the design world, like Shimon Nave. Uh, in Israel, and then talked to the division commander that actually used design in operations in Israel uh, as part of a domestic operation. And so had the, the opportunity at the, at the theor theoretical level to understand and learn a little bit about the theory of design and, and how it can be applied in, in practice. I will say that uh, not all members of the military will embrace design theory, and that was my experience with some of my colleagues there. but. The way it was represented to us, I think, by the faculty really changed the way that I think about things, uh, complex problems, and, and using design is obviously one of the best ways to, to look at those wickedly complex problems and, and try to find a way to approach uh, to solution. The, the big takeaway that I got from both uh, learning it in my work college year and then teaching it uh, to majors with the same faculty member, Alice, um, was that design really is about a way of thinking. And so thinking holistically about problems. Uh, and if you, if you can think holistically about those while kind of zooming in on the area of specific issue, but understanding the complexity and the interdependence between that and the rest of the system, um, it allowed me at least to imagine as we're zooming in on that problem and framing it in a way that, that there are going to be effects outside of that narrow frame in that broader system because of those interdependencies. And so Alice was very clear that design is really just a way about thinking. Uh, and it's creative, it's collaborative, uh, which are both things that I'm personally interested in. And then she really left us with the impression that um, I think a lot of us are built prepared to conduct analysis and, and a level of analytical thinking uh, as opposed to synthesis and trying to synthesize um, and, and through synthesis experiment and, and see how those interdependent pieces react to uh, changes in that system. So again, that you can focus in on where that problem area is and understand there are second, third, fourth, fifth order effects uh, as, you, as you kind of create ripples in that ecosystem. So really it was just a way of thinking about things in whole, uh, holistically, uh, in system. Um, so the causal narrative is an example of one, right? So why are things the way they are? And that allows you to explain. Um, and so I use causal narrative regularly, both written and verbal as I engage with people to help them understand why things are the way they are. And they can then help me, um, they can help support the what we need to change in order to seek the effect we're looking for. Recently, in early November, we briefed Armed Forces Council Executive on, a, on, a, on an issue that we had that we needed, they, we needed to resolve and we needed to engage at that level. And over the course of almost a year, with commander's intent expressed early, uh, we used design to work through how we, would, how we would approach the problem. And so it was, uh, again, collaborative, iterative, and as those iterations were happening, as assessment was being completed, we looped back to make certain that it was still leading to the desired outcome that we were seeking. And using an operational design construct in terms of lines of effort and so on, we were able to arrange both analysis of specific aspects of the problem, um, where a small team would look at it through the lens of the commander's expressed intent step out and talk to broad stakeholders who would be affected by the changes that we were proposing. And, and that iteratively happened over the course of many months. Um, 
we had the same iterative approach with my boss to say, hey, this is what we need uh, in terms of an organization. This is what we need from you for help. Um, this is what we need from you in terms of direction and guidance. So that iterativeness uh, informed the process. Um, but at the end of the day, it led to a, a presentation, a series of briefings to get decision and guidance, and then it led to an ultimate presentation to the senior leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces, um, where we got the endorsement that we needed in order to move forward. And so there was very detailed work going on to say, okay, you know, it was an organizational change. So how do we change the structure and the authorities, responsibilities, and accountabilities? What are the policy documents that govern that? What are the military positions that constitute that organization? So there's lots of detailed work, but at the end of the day, that conceptual overlay of what we were trying to achieve in terms of change was the basis of all of those interactions that ultimately led to a decision to uh, to support that recommendation. Um, so I would say that the majority of the people that were involved in, you know, dozens and dozens of people, uh, the majority probably had never studied or participated in a design exercise. Um, but my lead for that analysis was uh, attended the same program I did a year after I did, and uh, and so as as he and I would collaborate, we would use the language that we learned down in Leavenworth uh, because it was a common frame of reference, right? That's the great thing about doctrine; it gives you a common language. But we would not necessarily use that language as we engaged with the people whose insights and advice and thoughts we needed. Um, and so, uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily talk about framing the environment or uh, problem framing. Uh, I think problem statement was used as part of the engagements with people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you can find the common lexicon, uh, which is useful because sometimes technical lexicon or technical jargon can be alienating. And, uh, and this process, because it was so important that it be transparent and collaborative, we, we couldn't can have that. And so, uh, so my lead for this was quite astute uh, as an expert communicator and, uh, and used the skills that he had to lead it, notwithstanding uh, the, how it was being done, uh, as opposed to just leading somebody through the thinking and the process to get to the outcome. If people aren't comfortable with the language and some of the, some of the underpinning theories and systemic operational design, some of those, some of it's quite dense. And I, I think that the last thing we would want to do is alienate those people whose input we would value and want because they are probably the expert in whatever it is that we're trying to work through. So, you know, ideas, complex ideas like retention, uh, how do we do that except to get the invite or the input and advice from people who understand the drivers that lead to people exiting or staying within the system. If you alienate them, you're not going to get the input you need to better understand. And uh, and the, the personnel management system is so complex. There's so many policies that compete with other uh, desired outcomes that uh, design thinking absolutely applies to that. And unless people understand what design thinking is about, I think using design language would probably be counterproductive.